This episode of Full Armor Radio is brought to you by CR101 Radio Network. CR101 Radio Network is a Christian reconstruction internet radio station that hosts and broadcasts lectures, sermons, and podcasts 24-7. You can learn more at CR101Radio.com. We're also brought to you by GCS Apprenticeship Program, which is dedicated to training the next generation of Christian teachers so they can own and operate successful and profitable Christian schools. You can learn more at GCSApprenticeship.com. And now to the show. Hello and welcome to Full Armor Radio. I'm your host, John O'Rourke, and welcome to another episode of Getting Kicked Off a College Campus for Sharing the Gospel. Uh, Actually, this is the first time it's happened, but that's what we're going to be talking about today. How I got uh, kicked off campus, uh, kicked off college campus for sharing the gospel. Um, So today's episode is going to be kind of a mashup. You know, if if you follow this ministry podcast, you know that I do. Two, uh, two types of podcasts. One, Full Armor Radio, which is just um, talking about things, uh, biblical things and things related to, to doctrine, um, a lot of times evangelism, apologetics, that sort of thing. But I also put up Evangelism Encounters, which is just um, audio of recordings that I have of me talking to people, sharing the gospel with them, that sort of thing, out in the public. So today is going to be a mixing of them both. I'm going to tell you a little story, and uh, and then also play the audio from the conversation I had with, with someone um, at college campus, um, East Tennessee State University, um, this week, and how I got kicked off of campus for doing it. So let's get into it. Here's Here's what happened. So... Um, if you're unfamiliar with, with what I do, basically I, I you know, go out and do evangelism. I share the gospel with people. Um, and I typically do it through, through one-on-one conversations. Um, I do this out and about, but I spend a good amount of time at the local college campus doing that, going and talking to people um, and all that. So basically what I do is I approach somebody on campus and I'll say, hey, you know, you're busy. Um, I'm looking for people who, who have a few minutes to, uh, to do an interview, interview conversation with me. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. What, what's it about? And I'll say, you know, it's, it's, I'm asking people what they believe happens after death. You know, asking, you know, if you believe in an afterlife, that sort of thing. And most of the time people say, okay, yeah, sure. And I'll say, okay, is it okay with you if I do an audio recording? of our conversation. And they say, yeah, sure. Um, I used to do video recordings a lot too. Um, and I'll probably do that eventually again, but, um, audio recordings, um, one, people are usually more willing to do that. And two, they're, they're good for, you know, just the podcast, um, the evangelism encounters. So I'd say I do that. So people say, yeah, 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 sure. I'll, um, that's fine if you do an audio recording. So I'll, I'll take my phone out, you know, start the recorder and I'll ask them the question and we'll go from there. And, you know, based on what they answer, we'll, we'll, you know, I'll try to answer their objections that they may have to Christianity, give the gospel to them. And, you know, you know, basically almost every time I've done this, it's gone pretty well. Sometimes people have gotten angry, but not a ton of people, just a few. And um, people will say, oh, it's a pretty interesting conversation. At the very least, people usually say, yeah, I appreciate you coming and talking to me. It's very interesting. And, uh, and that's about it. You know, I get the gospel across them, answer their objections. And, um, you know, sometimes if they're young men, I'll, I'll offer to you know, do a Bible study with them or give them my contact information, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how I've done it. That's how I've been doing it since, you know, September of 2019, since I started doing this ministry. Um, it's been going very well. I've done it there at the campus um, a ton. I've uh, talked to hundreds of people on that campus. Um, but something happened a little bit different um, this time. So I, so I approached this girl. This was um, a few days ago on, on Monday morning. I got over there starting my day, as I do many other times, go over there to find somebody to um, share the gospel with. So it's like 9... 9.30 in the morning or something, um, probably around 9, I think, can't remember. Um, getting there, pe- people are not, uh, you know, there's not a ton of people there yet. Um, there's not a ton of people on campus there in general right now because of their their restrictions that they have. But, so I find somebody, I see somebody sitting alone uh, on a chair, so I approach them and do what I normally do, ask them, hey, are you busy? I'm looking for people to do interviews with you know, what happens after you die, that sort of thing. And and they say, and she said, sure, that sounds fine. I said, can I do an audio recording? She said, yeah, absolutely, that's fine. 
So I started up, put the put the phone um, on the table, it was recording, and I asked my question. Um, so this girl, she claimed to grow up, you know, Catholic, um, but she said something, she kind of explained the Catholic view of what happens after death, and then she said, well, something to the effect of, for my own beliefs, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure who God is. I believe in a higher power, but it could be Buddha for all I know. So she said something to that effect. It's like, okay. So I talked to her a little bit, I think, you know, about who Jesus is and asked her, you know, she, she talked a lot and we're going to get into this recording a little bit, but she, um, you know, she ended up saying that, that she believes Jesus is God. And I said, well, don't you think that Jesus knows what happens after death? And she agreed. So yeah. Okay. So anyway, so she was talking about heaven, hell, purgatory, Catholic, you know, view of afterlife. So anyway, I started talking to her about the gospel um, eventually into this conversation. Started talking about how, you know, we're sinners, how Jesus um, died to take the penalty in the place of sinners on the cross, that he kept the law in the place of sinners and, and credits the righteousness to them. And I think somewhere right around there, um, she she got all annoyed and was saying, why are you even asking me these questions? You know, what's the, why are you talking about? I don't even know you type of thing. I was like, okay, well, you know, obviously I'd already asked to do an interview. So that was the reason, but I told her my motivation. I said, well, you know, I care about you. I want you to, to know the gospel, um, to believe the gospel, to be saved. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want that for you. I care about you. I know I don't really know you, but I do care about you. And she said something like, well, this makes me very uncomfortable. I'm not comfortable with this. I'm like, Okay. You know, and she started rebuking me for, for like sharing the gospel with people. You shouldn't you shouldn't go up to strangers and talk about these things with them. Blah 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 blah. She said something like, You've been very nice to me, but you shouldn't go up to strangers and do that. And I was like, Okay, I just kinda kept my mouth shut. Um, during that, somewhere in there, her friend comes up and says, Hey, I need you, I need your help, we need to go right now. Um, that could have been just a coincidence. Um, it also is possible that she texted her to come save her from the conversation she was having with me because she was texting while I was talking to her. I'm not sure either way. It's possible. Possible is just a coincidence. Anyway, she gets up and leaves. And um, I think, okay, that didn't go well. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, that's kind of a bummer. But I got up and I started looking around again for someone else to talk to. I, I left the building, went to another building, couldn't really find anybody there. So I came back to this building. It's been probably about 10 minutes since I finished talking to this girl. So I'm walking through the building. Um, well, actually, I'm walking through the building and I see her with her friend outside of the building because the building has huge windows. And I think they saw me and they dart the other way. I'm like, please. It's like, <laughs> what, what in the world? Like, overreacting. And, and then I walk up and I walk back around uh, probably about two, three minutes later, maybe five minutes later, something like that. And I see a security officer um, walking. I think, huh. And then, and then all of a sudden it hits me in, in the head. I say, oh, he's, coming, he's approaching me, isn't he? So I'm rolling my eyes on my head. I'm like, oh, please. So he does. He comes up and approaches me and says, yeah, I received a, I received a complaint. received a call that, um, that somebody is in here you know, approaching people and, and recording conversations about religious matters. You doing that? I'm like, yes, I, I'm doing that. Um, and I explained to him, yeah, you know, I got people ask their permission to talk to them, give them the option. It's totally voluntary. Ask their permission to record them. She said, yes, I talked to her, um, you know, and, uh, you know, she got all upset about it, but I didn't do anything wrong. Didn't harass her. Didn't try to make her stay or anything like that. It was completely voluntary. And then he asked me, he said, you a student here? And I said, no, I'm just visiting the campus. He says, well, okay, then, then you, you cannot do that essentially he and then his supervisor came over and they said basically you can't go up and talk to people um about religious stuff i guess they said there's two th two things i could do he says you could you could um go you could sign up schedule a time to sit go to our free speech zone right this free speech zone that's outside the library where i can stay in that little circle and talk to people and at my scheduled time or they said you could become a student here and then you'd have reason to be on campus. But they said otherwise, if you come back here and you're caught doing this, you could be banned from the campus and even charged with trespassing. Right? So there's some threatening going on in that regard. Um, they were pretty relatively nice to me, although they did, you know, bring those things. So I said, okay. And they said, well, you know, just, just leave the campus for today. If you want to do those avenues, you can do those things, but you can't be on campus today. So, so I complied and, and I left. Um, so essentially, 
um, that's kind of the, the story of what happens. Um, but one thing I wanted to I want to show today um, is one I just want to talk about that and um, just mention that I don't actually believe that those things that they told me are really necessarily true in terms of um, the legality of it. Um, that's something that's that's highly questionable. Um, that I have to stay outside in this little circle when this is a public campus and there's outside public grounds. Um, the inside inside of buildings, um, that's still questionable, um, which is where I was, but they told me I can't even go anywhere outside except for in that free speech zone if I have to sign up for, for that time. So the, the legality, the constitutionality of those things is highly questionable. But the, the main point I want to bring up is, that the girl, is about the girl I talked to. Professing Catholic, kind of. Um, said she grew up Catholic, pretty quickly told me that she's not sure if she believes it, and then went on to contradict herself and defend Catholic beliefs pretty rigorously. Um, in the beginning, like I said, she told me that she believes in a higher power, not sure who he is, could be Buddha. At the end, she's mad at me and says, I told you from the beginning, I believe the gospel. Well, there's obviously two problems with that. One, Catholics don't believe the gospel. They don't believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. They don't believe in justification by faith alone. Um, they add their own human merit to it. Um, and if you don't believe me, you can check out the Council of Trent. Um, their, their section on justification, Canon 9 on justification, very clearly says if you believe in justification by faith alone, that you're, that you're anathema, which means you're condemned by God. Um, even on an experiential level, um, I just did a debate recently with a Roman Catholic guy on the doctrine of purgatory, and uh, he very clearly says you have to atone for your own sins to go to heaven, um, and that there's there's obviously human merit, your own merit involved in, in salvation when you listen to it. Plenty, it's very clear, no question there. So one, if she's a sincere Catholic, um, she doesn't believe the gospel, but two, she told me she doesn't even know who God is, so she certainly doesn't believe uh, the gospel because of that confession. So she ended up lying to me. Um, that's the benefit of, of, you know, an added benefit of having these recordings is that she t totally lied to me. Um, between when we first started talking to 20 minutes later when we finished talking, she said that she believed the gospel and that she told me she believed the gospel, but she didn't say anything like that. She actually said something very different um, and just straight up contradicted herself and lied. Somebody who supposedly believes the gospel is the very same person who, who called uh, security on me because I was sharing the gospel. Um, when I asked her if she'd willingly and voluntarily like to do a conversation interview and she complied and then got angry and acted like I was doing something evil, um, I did nothing wrong here. Nothing wrong here. Just shared the gospel with her. She even says in here while she's angry that I was very nice to her. So her, her actions are very self-contradictory. Her statements are very self-contradictory. Um, but all that to say, it just, it just points out, just want to point out that true Christians love the advancement of the gospel. Okay. True Christians love the advancement of the gospel. They love it when other Christians are accurately sharing the gospel with people. They, they approve of it and encourage it, right? They want other people to be saved. They want people to do that. Okay, when I've met true Christians, unlike this girl, when I met real Christians, they've always said, that's really good. I'm really glad. And um, they've been happy. They've been excited about it. And so on and so forth. There were guys I talked to the week before who were Christians, and they were real excited about it. Um, but here's somebody who, who doesn't know who God is, doesn't believe the gospel, continuously says a few times in here that she has to save herself, and then gets angry and calls the campus police on me for sharing the gospel with people. Um, there's nothing more contrary, you know, to the gospel than, than those types of things, those, those beliefs and those actions. So what I'm going to do is I'm probably just going to play this. I might in the beginning just point out where she says a few things and I'm just going to let it play, um, through the end. You listen to the conversation and, um, and we'll go, go from there. Um, so I might pop in here, uh, here and there and, and give some, give some comments. So, uh, here's my, uh, my conversation with this angry Catholic girl who got who called the campus police on me. So here we go. Yeah, that's the question. So what do you think? So like I was raised in a Catholic, very Catholic home, and so like what Catholics believe after death is obviously like your soul leaves your body, and you 
get judged um, based on what your life was like. So if you were like a very good person, you had good morals, you did everything according to Christ, then you go to heaven. If you have um, obviously bad morals and you and you sinned a lot and you weren't remorseful for anything that you did, then you go to hell. But what's different between Catholics and most Christians is that they believe in purgatory, which is kind of like a timeout zone. That's the best way I can explain it. Um, so say you die in a car accident somewhere, mm -hmm. and um, there were some things in your life that were bad, but you were remorseful, but you didn't have time to like really reconcile. Mm -hmm. That's what kind of like what purgatory is for, is people who didn't get a chance to reconcile on the bad things that they've done. And so that's where they would stay in purgatory, which I couldn't, I wish I could give you the Bible, but the Bible verses that explain purgatory. But um, it's basically just like an inner dimension of nothingness mm -hmm. where no one knows what it is. But that's that's what I grew up believing. Okay. What I actually believe, I couldn't tell you. Okay. I do believe there's a God. Okay. I do believe there is a supernatural being. Sure. What God? I have no idea. Because there are some days I'm just like, it could be the Catholic God. It could be just a Christian God. I mean, it could be Buddha. For all I know, I really don't know what's after that. It could be nothing, and that's what's kind of scary is that it is nothing. Hmm. And that my life does not serve a purpose. Okay. But um, there is still the Christian in me that is like, that I do have a purpose. And that there is a God and life after death. But, yeah, that's basically it. So what right, so just, just stopping there for a minute. You can hear heard all that. It's actually a pretty decent explanation of purgatory. Um, and... You know, she said, could I give you the Bible verses? Well, I would say that there are no Bible verses on purgatory. But then she, then she, you know, that's what she says, though. Well, I don't know what I believe. It's like kind of torn. Like, I don't know. Could be, could be nothing. Could be Catholic. Could be not Catholic. Could be Buddha for all I know. Could be anything. I don't know. But that's her attitude there. Keep that in mind because later on she's going to lie about that. Continuing on. What do you believe then about about the Bible? Do you think the Bible is God's word? I, to an extent, yes. So, again, raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, Catholics believe all of Jesus' teachings in the New Testament to be true. When it comes to the Old Testament, we see that more as like interpreted history rather than God's word, because that isn't direct. It, it is direct source, but like with Jesus, Jesus was actually God. Mm -hmm. And people were actually with Jesus and actually took like, his words and wrote it down. With the Old Testament, you get things like Genesis and Exodus that were people just re-recording things that were interpreted for thousands and retranslated for thousands and thousands of years. So, like, with the Old Testament, we do believe that most of it is God's will, but obviously there are things like slavery and divorce and just obviously things in the Old Testament we cannot determine to be true and we cannot determine to be not true. Uh, for me personally, the Old Testament is just like... Um, and it's, it, it's, it's just like... Uh, I guess the prologue to Jesus, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things in the Old Testament that can be interpreted many different ways, and I know a lot of people have different um, ideas about that. Uh, for me, I just try to live the way Jesus would want me to live. So, just stopping there for a minute. Just, I don't, I don't, the Catholics that I've come across do not have that low a view of the Old Testament. I don't really think that that's accurate. Could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that they would not say that it's not, it's only kind of God's word. I'm pretty sure they would say that it is God's word. Um, 
um, officially it, it is. Um, your, your, your average Catholic, they're going to have different beliefs, obviously. Here's somebody who, at least in, according to her upbringing, she was told that the, Catholic, that the Old Testament is, not, is only like, we don't really know if it's true. Um, but I just want to, just to be fair to, to, I'd say most Catholics, they'd probably very much disagree with her, just FYI. Continuing on. Okay. So here, so with regard to the first question I asked you about afterlife, you know, Jesus, you said Jesus was God. Mm -hmm. So don't you think that Jesus would know what happens after death then? Oh, absolutely. Okay. 100%. Well, do you, do you know what Jesus taught happens after death? I mean, he's, he's talked about what happens after death. Mm -hmm. Um, again, I, I honestly, I'm going to tell you, I'm being a big hypocrite right now because I have not practiced Catholicism in years, mostly because I'm dealing with my own personal life and still trying to understand everything that I, I want Jesus for me to do. But Jesus has talked about life after death. He's come, he's talked about, you know, coming on the last day mm -hmm. and the judgment day. And, you know, I fully believe he will come again. When that is, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. It could be tomorrow. It could be a thousand years from now when I'm long and dead. I, you know, I don't know. But he has, he's definitely said there is, you know, life after death. Yeah, and he says that there's a heaven and a hell. Yeah. Right. So do you, so thinking through that, do you think that that's what it is, one of those things now? Because Jesus would know, right? Yeah. Okay. So if if you were to die, you know, whenever, today or something, mm -hmm. and stand before God, and he were to ask you, you know, why should I let you into heaven? How do you think you'd answer that? It's not up to me. Again, that, right. that's, that's not up to me. That's up to God. That's up to Jesus. Um... If I'm being completely honest right now, I don't. I could not tell you if I could go into heaven right now. I think, again, as a Catholic, he maybe put me in purgatory because there are a lot of things that I have regrets of in my life and a lot of things I am remorseful for. I'm just not at that stage yet in my personal life where I can atone for that. And I do want to, and I do plan on doing that. But if I were to die today... It's not up to me. It's up to God and Jesus or who's ever making the call when I die. Um, so do you know what this, according to Jesus, what the standard is to get into heaven? So there's a, so there's a lot of, st I, I feel like this is a hard question because the standard seems to change with every Christian denomination we talk to. Well, what did Jesus say? Because he said it pretty plainly. Do you know? He literally, he, I Again, I'm not good at remembering Bible quotes, but he okay. literally just said, like, follow me and you will be saved. Like, just, like, with Catholics, they're, um, they take that as works of acts of doing good deeds and going to church and doing, um, you remember the, uh, I think this is in John, you remember where he's at the Last Supper and, um, He's giving the apostles like the bread and the wine. He says, "This is my body and blood, and do this in remembrance of me." Catholics act upon this every week at sun on Sunday. Um, they firmly believe that Peter was the foundation of the church because he told Peter that, like, "Upon this rock I shall build my church." To Peter. And so when it comes to Catholics, at least, and I do kind of believe this to an extent, we focus on the golden rule, which is treat thy neighbors as thyself, and doing the acts of what the apostles did after Jesus died. So we call that holy communion, or um, I can't remember the other word for it. The Eucharist. Yeah, the Eucharist. And that's something that's, that's what makes Catholics Catholics. What's the difference between Christianity and Catholics is obviously the Pope. Um, that's one thing. There's actually a few other things, too. Well, yeah, but and, that's like the main thing well, most people focus on. Here's what I'd say is the main thing. And, and you can see, if, see the difference here. So I think the, I think the main thing is the view of salvation. Okay, and here's why. Because what you just described, I think, is pretty accurate. 
of Catholicism. Trying to be a good person, atoning for your sins to get out of purgatory. If you don't atone for them now, you're going to atone for them in purgatory before you can get to heaven, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here, here's, here's the difference, though, between, you know, Christianity and that. It's that what I was saying before is that, you know, God, God has this standard. Jesus taught this standard, and he said that it was perfection. He said, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that should be a little bit of a jolt to us, <laughs> because we're not perfect, right? Well, I mean, we've never been perfect. Right. Mankind has not been perfect. We will never be perfect. We yeah. are humans with flaws. That's how God made us that way. Well, he made, he made you know, Adam not sinner, but he sinned, and then all of us sin as well. So he didn't make us sinners, but we no, became sinners. No, he didn't make us sinners, but he did give us free will, mm-hmm. which he knew we would come to make our own choices. Right. And that was the reason why he tested them in the garden, was because that was their choice. Mm-hmm. So, so since all of us are not perfect, so that standard of perfection up here, it's like we're not even close. Because if you think about like the Ten Commandments, mm-hmm. I've broken all of them. Think about it, like, have you ever lied before? Yeah. Yeah, right? Like, who knows how many times? I couldn't tell you, personally. You know, stealing something. I'm not talking about, rock, like, holding up a store, but taking something that doesn't belong to you. Mm-hmm. Um, disobedience to parents. You know, taking God's name in vain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. All of those things, I'm not perfect. That's one thing that's very obvious, is that none of us are perfect, like he just said. So if God is judging us based upon his law which he says that he does, mm-hmm. he's going to find us guilty. That's bad news. Right. Because what that means is because God is good and righteous and holy, mm-hmm. he can't just let a, a lawbreaker go scot-free. He has to bring justice to that. Yes, but Catholics also believe in the act of forgiveness. That's why, again, not only do we have the act of Holy Communion, we also have the act of reconciliation. And we believe God is a merciful and understanding mm-hmm. God. And again, you're right. Humanity is not perfect. We have lots of flaws. I honestly, myself, personally, have broken a lot of the commandments. Mm-hmm. I'm not even a perfect Catholic. Heck, I'm not even a perfect Christian sometimes. But when it comes to reconciliation, again, Catholics believe in... So how we save ourselves is feeding our soul not only with the sacraments, but in seeking and obtaining forgiveness. And so this is a lot of misconception, like misunderstanding that people don't understand when I have to explain um, my Catholic religion. When we go into reconciliation, we ask for forgiveness and we receive that forgiveness, but in turn, we have to do something in order to obtain that forgiveness. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, I understand. I understand yeah. what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's more it's it's more than just like saying I'm sorry and then receiving forgiveness. Mm-hmm. We actually have to like do something. Mm-hmm. Now, what that can be determined by the priest because we believe that the priest is supposed to be in standing for for Jesus. He's supposed to represent Jesus to us. He's not Jesus. Mm -hmm. A lot of people misunderstand that. He is not Jesus to us, but he acts for Jesus for us on earth because Jesus could not do so because he's in heaven right now. Um, But that's how we forgive our sins and how we become, I wouldn't say sin free, but that's how we make up for the mistakes that we've done. And that's how we um, kind of think of the best word right now. Um, that's ju- that's just how like, we save ourselves. I'm I again I'm not an expert in a lot of Christian denominations. I know Episcopals do something very similar. Mm-hmm. I know Anglicans do the same thing. Um, I'm not sure about the other denominations, but in terms of Forgiveness, I firmly believe when you make a mistake, if you are truly remorseful for it, you ask for forgiveness and then you make up for it by doing what Jesus would want you to do. 
he, here's here's kind of where I'm, what I'm saying is that I believe that God is is incredibly forgiving and merciful and loving um, beyond you know even full comprehension. Okay, but here here's the difference and how it is. Because what you've said a few times is how you say how we save ourselves. Okay, what I'm saying is something different than that. I'm saying that we can't save ourselves. I'm saying that we need a savior who saves us completely. And this well, is, and this that's is, what Jesus is to us. He's already saved us by right. sacrificing himself. Right. So I want to talk about that for a second, because that's, that's real important. So what I said before is that we're guilty of breaking the law. God will find us guilty. So how can God be, how can God forgive us then? Is a pretty important question. Um, as we are, have not met the standard of perfection, um, and we deserve a penalty because of breaking the law. So what do you believe Jesus did to save people? He, he suffered for us. He in, endured immense suffering, physical pain. He was God. He did not have to do that for mankind, but he did. He came into this world like every human being through the birth of his mother Mary. You know, he endured human pain physically, mentally, and emotionally. He did that for us, and he didn't have to. And that's why, you know, I love Jesus so much is because me suffering every day through just, like, little things, like just personal things, mentally and emotionally, Jesus suffered through mankind. He took on humanity's hate and sin and anger through the pain of of dying on the crucifix. He's already saved us. It's but it's up to us now whether or not we want to be saved. That's what I believe. And so, so real quick, um, there's five minutes and twenty two seconds left in this. Okay, five minutes left basically. Notice how everything's fine, right? Nothing, nothing weird, nothing bad, nothing is. Even even seems really contentious here. Um, she has expressed pretty plainly um, a false way of salvation through works. She said it very plainly. Um, but in the next few minutes, things kind of take a downward a downward spiral. So here's the next few minutes. Here we go. There are some people who don't want to be saved. Mm-hmm. There, and I that's fine. I mean, I know there's people with different religions and stuff. But, like, for me, Jesus has given me this open door to enter. And it's up to me whether or not I choose to go through that door. Okay. So let me, let me take a minute and kind of say kind of say something where I'm coming from, and then I want to get your thoughts on it real quick. Okay? Yeah, of course. Okay. So basically what I'm saying, like I said, is that we are, we're guilty of breaking God's law. God will find us guilty of breaking God's law if he judges us simply by the Ten Commandments. Um, because he's righteous and he's holy. He's a good judge. He won't just let a lawbreaker go scot-free. It's kind of like if I was in a, at the courthouse downtown and I said, yeah, I murdered people and robbed some stores, but can you let me go? If the judge said, yeah, I can let you go, it's not a big deal, that'd make him a really bad judge. Yeah, he wouldn't care about justice. And God's not like that. Um, he's, he's good. He's not bad like, like that judge would have been. So what I deserve is a penalty for my sins. I deserve hell. But what Jesus did by his death on the cross is that he took the penalty in my place fully. All of my sins. Every penalty that I deserve for my sins was paid for by Jesus. So instead of me getting the punishment for my sins, Jesus took it in my place. So I don't have to face the penalty of hell because Jesus has faced an equivalent penalty in my place. My guilt was transferred to him, and he bore the penalty so that I could receive mercy. Yeah. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay. Yes, I do. Now, here's the other aspect of it. Jesus kept, did actually keep the law perfectly. He actually is the only person who met the standard. He was sinless, right? That's the standard to go to heaven. Just as my guilt can be transferred to his account, and he'd be punished for my sins, not for his own sins, but he was punished for my sins. His righteousness or his law keeping can be transferred to my account so that I get the benefit of that righteousness, which is 
heaven because the standard to go to heaven is perfection. I need Jesus' righteousness on my account. It's kind of like if I earned you know, a million dollars and transferred it to your bank account. You didn't earn any of it, but now it's yours. It's on your account. It's kind of like that. He earns all the law keeping, all the righteousness by keeping a law, something I could never do, and transfers it to my account so that before God, he can actually accept me because now how do I look? My guilt's been paid for, and I have perfect righteousness on me. I'm robed, clothed in his righteousness. Can, can I ask you a question? What, what is this for? Like, I'm just, like, I'm honestly just curious, because I was thinking about this the whole conversation. Why, like, why are, why are you asking these questions? Like, I'm a complete random stranger that you just met today. That's right. Because do you know what the gospel was? Obviously. You do? Yes. I'm talking about it right now. I know. What's the point of the gospel? Why do people need to hear the gospel? Well, based on Christianity, the, Jesus' word. Well, it's what Jesus did yeah. to save people from their sins. Okay, so, I don't know why you're sitting here with me, though. I'm just about to say. So, you're right, you are a perfect stranger to me. I just met you, I don't know, 15 minutes ago. But I do care about you. I, didn't, I don't know where you're coming from. I just met you. But it's important to me that you be saved. I don't want you to face the penalty for your sins. Okay. I, okay. I'm not comfortable anymore. I'm just going to tell you now. Um, you've been very nice. But I am a Christian. I am Catholic. I fully believe in the gospel. I've told you that. I don't... Now, I don't need you to tell me that I need to be saved. I know I do. Right, so there's that's a straight up lie. Um, she has not indicated at all by this conversation that she is a staunch believer. She said actually indicated quite the opposite. She's also very, very clearly said that she believes that she has to do works in order to be saved. That is a direct denial of the gospel. Direct denial. This is a this is a flat out lie. If you go way back to the beginning, what'd she say? I don't even know who God is. Then she said a few minutes later, Jesus is God. That's a contradiction. And then she goes on to say, I've heard the gospel, I believe the gospel, and I told you I believe the gospel. No, she hasn't, because we just started talking about the gospel. She has not even mentioned the word gospel, as far as I can recall, nor has she actually really talked about what Jesus did. She's talked about how she has to do works in order to atone for her sins and to you know, do reconciliation and all that. So there's about one minute left. Continue on. So I don't know why you're still sitting here preaching to me about the gospel of Jesus when I already know all this. Because I literally told you right at the beginning that I believe in heaven and hell. And as a Catholic, I believe in purgatory. And I believe in the atonement for sin and that humanity is flawed and that we need to be saved. None of that is the gospel. None of that's the gospel. Um, purgatory is a denial of the gospel um, because it says you have to atone for your own sins um, and merit um, merit that atonement. Um, but but the point here is that even if she was a staunch Catholic, I would still be having to share the gospel with her, which I was just getting into. Gospels do not believe, or gospels, Catholics do not believe what I said about Jesus that he imputes righteousness to our account. They do not believe that. Okay? Not, not, in, not in so much to mean as, sorry, I should say, be more clear. They do not believe that his righteousness alone justifies us. Right? They don't believe that justification is, is a legal declaration. They believe it's also a change of the heart so that you have to become more and more subjectively, subjectively holy. That's not the gospel. She has not told me she believes the gospel. She doesn't believe the gospel. She says she doesn't even know who God is. This is just a flat-out falsehood. 54 seconds left. So I don't know why you're here. Well, because they're very different things, what you described and, and what the gospel is. Okay, well, that's... I mean... Hey, hey. What if it's Okay, so I need, like, backup. Okay. I... Her friend just uh, came to, to retrieve her from the conversation. I gotta go. That's okay. my job. All right, absolutely. Um, Good luck, but maybe you shouldn't go around to people and be misinterrogated by strangers. Like, it just, I feel like, because, like, 
the more we talked about it, the more I felt uncomfortable with you. I felt like interrogated by you, like just talking about it. Okay. Interrogated as in like asking questions, like an interview, which is what we agreed to do in the beginning. Um, there's no way. Interrogation brings about images of, of harsh, like bad cop things. There's no way listening to this, any objective person listening to this is going to say, yeah, you were really hard on her. You were really harsh. Um, I didn't say that much in this, uh, this particular conversation. Um, she said a whole lot more than me. I asked a few questions, which is exactly what we agreed on. So 10 seconds left. So I would keep that in mind. It was nice meeting you. Good luck to you, but okay. Yeah, so it was nice meeting you. Good luck to you. You know, you're very nice in this, but you shouldn't do this. Um, nice meeting you and good luck to you is very disingenuous because she ended up calling the campus security on me probably within the next five to ten minutes. So that's what happened. Um, that's the full thing right there. That's the full recording. Um, she left. I stopped it. And about 10 to 15 minutes later, I was approached by campus security, as I said in the beginning, and told that I can't be doing that. Um, but... There are other avenues that I'll go in, and um, I'm not sure. Like I said in the beginning, this this may not even, what they said is very probably not constitutional, very probably not true. Um, so I'm not too, too concerned about it. You know, God has a good purpose for this, for opposition to the gospel and the advancement of the gospel. Um, and, you know, I expect this will ultimately lead to, to more opportunities to share the gospel. Um, I expect that. Um, when there's spiritual warfare here, because you notice like 17 minutes of that 20 minute conversation was, was pretty cordial until I shared the gospel, uh, until I actually talked about what Jesus did and, and she got real like annoyed by it. Um, and so, so annoyed that she thought it was so, so wicked what I was doing or something so offensive that she had to call the campus police for who knows what she told them. I mean, all they said is that somebody's going around recording people doing, talking about religious stuff, which, I mean, is technically true. It probably, if that's all she said, that's leaving out stuff makes it sound negative when really it was a total voluntary thing. You listen to the beginning, how, how casual the whole thing was. Um, the only thing that's, that's regrettable about this, this, um, conversation that I wish I was able to talk a little bit about faith alone to her. Um, but you know, she ended up getting all frustrated and then some, someone came and, and told her that they needed backup, um, for whatever, um, whatever's going on, um, there, whether that's legitimate or not, I don't know. Again, I saw them about five minutes later outside. Um, didn't sound like it was an overly big deal if it was dealt with that quickly. Um, but you never know. I'm not going to assume that that part was, was a lie. But I do know other things here that are documented lies. Um, that's very sad. But here's, here's the deal. And here's how we sh what we should take away from this. Um, is that no matter, no matter who you know, claims to be a, a Christian, whether they claim to be a Protestant or a Catholic or whatever, if they're not a true Christian they are technically in opposition to the gospel because they're in rebellion against God. Here's somebody who, again, claims that they believe the gospel um, and that they told me that they told me they believe the gospel, which that they didn't, but they claim they believe the gospel and, and that they know all these things, but yet actively oppose the sharing of the gospel. Um, those two things cannot work together. It's, it's inconsistent, self-contradictory, like many things that she said and did. So, um, with that, uh, I just want to, you know, encourage, encourage you all, um, this sort of stuff, this is a little bit of backlash, a little bit of pushback. Ultimately, it's a little bit, a little bit discouraging to have this obstacle put in place at the campus, but ultimately, uh, I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. I, I, I fully expect to have, uh, great further opportunities at the campus, um, to talk to people about the gospel, um, in the future, I'm very optimistic that this will not ultimately be uh, too big a hindrance um, to that. What does God's word says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church? 
Think about that. The gates of hell are their gates. They're defensive, meaning Christians with the gospel are storming the gates of hell, meaning they are breaking down the doors and Jesus is saving people out of Satan's kingdom and the gates will not withstand against the church with the gospel. They, it will not withstand. So I go out there as part of Christ's body, part of Christ's church, bring the gospel to people. No matter what Satan brings against the church, he will not be able to, to withstand when Christ, when we have Christ on our side, the Lord of all, the Lord over Satan, even. He's the king of everything. And with that, you know, I can rest in that and we can all rest in that. Even when we have these these little ways of pushback and opposition that we face here and there. So with that, thanks so much for watching, for listening. This is John O'Rourke with Full Armor Ministries. You're listening to Full Armor Radio. Uh, in this case, Full Armor Radio slash Evangelism Encounters. You can check those out on any um, podcast streaming thing, Spotify, Apple, Google, whatever. All Everything um, where you can stream podcasts, you'll find Full Armor Radio there. You can also find these on YouTube. You can also find some other videos uh, on the YouTube channel. It's Full Armor Ministries YouTube channel. So again, thanks so much for watching or for listening, and God bless you.